This is nothing but that sports talk. We you have the game. And welcome to nothing but that sports talk. I'm Rafiq Luzong alongside Gabby. Thank you for stopping by for the first time. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. I definitely was excited when you asked me to do it. Yeah, I mean, us four fans should stick together. Sports fans, yeah. You get oh, the yeah, picture. 100%. <laughs> sports fans are a very special breed of people. Exactly. So tell everybody about what you do and how you, why you got into sports and the teams you support. Yeah, sure. So I grew up a big Boston sports fan. I um, started watching a lot of Boston sports when I was really young, about four years old. We were actually at my cousin's house one day. I remember this distinctly. And um, they had the Red Sox game on. And they told me you should like the Red Sox. And I was like, okay. I mean, I didn't really know what they were at the time, but I was like, sure, that sounds fine. So then I started watching Red Sox games on my own at that point, which led into me watching other Boston teams on my own too. So I had that background, but I also grew up about 10 minutes or so from the UConn main campus. So I grew up going to UConn basketball and football games with my dad and I would sit on his lap and we'd watch games. And it was, it was just, uh, it was just, so I kind of was destined to be a sports fan. Um, so I'm used to watching games with my dad and talking sports and everything else with my cousins. But so my dad is actually a Yankees and Giants fan. So we had, you know, a little household rivalry going my whole life because he didn't like the same teams as me because my cousins beat him to it and got me on the Boston side um, before he got to me to be a New York fan. And when you live in Connecticut, there's a, a division. It's either a lot of times you're usually either a New York fan or a Boston fan. So it kind of just depends on, you know, family and everything else or a lot of people's fandom is mixed. But for the most part, it's generally either you're a Boston or New York fan. So I've been a Boston fan my whole life. Um, I've always been really passionate about sports. So I knew that it was something that I wanted to do for a while. So when I was looking at colleges, I was trying to find programs that had good sports media related programs. Cause I would watch, you know, a lot of sports anchors on TV and I was like, wow, I want to be one of those people that's, that's on air talking about sports. And that was something that was a big goal of mine. So started applying for colleges, looked at sports media programs. I ended up at Ithaca college which has a great program for media and sports and television. So they, I did a lot of, a lot of cool things there. I got hands-on experience right from freshman year in their TV studios and um, learning different roles within a TV studio. And I, I produced, I directed, I was on air. I did a lot of different things and I would go out and film. So our classes were very hands-on, but our school's TV station which was separate, just kind of an extracurricular activity, had a lot of different shows. So I was involved with a lot of the sports shows there. So um, it did that, worked for the sports radio station too, um, which was another fun extracurricular activity. I would do sports casts for them. Did a lot of internships when I was in college in different aspects of the media industry. So I really felt like I got a lot of exposure to a lot of different sides of the industry before I graduated. Um, because of all the different internships and everything that I did. So then graduated from Ithaca College in May 2018. It was definitely nerve wracking um, because I was like, wow, where do I go from here? Like, this is real adulthood now. I need to find a job. So I started applying for jobs. You know, I was applying for jobs all over the place, really all, all over the country because it was my first job out of college. So I knew that, you know, it was important for me to just be, um, you know, flexible and just be open-minded to different types of roles within sports because, because I was just coming out of college. So I applied for a lot of different positions and then um, reached out and sent an application into ESPN just because I didn't expect to hear back from them or anything. I just threw in an application. I was like, okay, yeah, sure. For ha ha's. So then a couple of days after I applied, they got back to me to do a phone interview. So I did a phone interview with them and then they invited me in for an in-person interview went in and interviewed in person with about six different people or so. So it was pretty intense, but it was, you know, it was really informative. They told me a lot about the company and everything else. And then, so I ended up getting offered a position shortly after that. So I started working at ESPN in August, 2018, which is crazy. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like uh, that much time has passed since I started, but time really does fly. But basically the position entails, you know, 
um, cutting video for all of our online and social media platforms. So the digital video social media team. So basically watching live games and basically looking out for key moments in those games that that would stand out to fans that they would want to see on our online platforms. So whether that be, you know, cool viral moments with fans that stand out on social media or just, you know, if a player has a really good game, we focus on that. So it was cutting a lot of highlights during watching live games and, um, you know, putting together different video clips to go and distribute to all of our online platforms. And then it also included a lot of longer form videos for YouTube. So basically what that, that means is basically just if, somebody has a good game, for example, if LeBron has, you know, a 40 point game or something, I would put together a highlight, a highlight video, like a longer form highlight video that features LeBron's points, and then put that on our NBA YouTube channel or something, or like, you know, it's a lot of being able to be creative and pitch your own ideas for video projects. So in 2018, I actually put together a compilation video of some of the, the top 10 craziest plays of the 2018 college football season. So that actually ended up doing really well on our YouTube channel. And then we put it on the sports center Instagram page and people were commenting like, this is great. Like this is one of the best things I've seen ESPN do. So that was definitely heartwarming for me. And one of my favorite things about the job is just seeing that type of stuff and, and how my work brings joy to fans. So, and this also involves a lot of watching our studio shows too, looking at the rundowns of what, what we're going to be talking about in our studio shows and basically um, following along with, with those because we cut a lot of content from our studio shows as well. So Stephen A does really well on our con on our on all of our platforms. So we cut a lot of Stephen A content or if one of our analysts has a hot take or a hot game prediction or something that fans might want to might want to see, we cut that stuff too. So it's a lot of multitasking and paying attention to a lot of different things knowing a lot of different storylines and understanding, um, you know, what the key aspects are in, in games and everything else and who the important teams and players are that fans like, and just what the major storylines for that day are in terms of the sports field, because the day to day really can vary based on what the main storylines are going on in sports. And so also recently I was nominated by my boss's boss to help launch the ESPN stories feature on the app. So basically it's, it's, it's kind of like an Instagram story. Basically people swipe through in their slides and they basically are short form videos that, that you swipe through that have to do with different storylines going on that day. So whether it's, you know, James Harden being traded, that's a, that's obviously going to be the biggest storyline from that day. So there was, we put together a story of um, our analysts reacting to him being traded, what that means for him, um, some tweets from our NBA people or from different athletes um, to talk about the, that trade and react to it and basically what it means for Brooklyn and everything else. So those types of storylines, but there are also game stories that we would do. So for example, I remember I put together a story on Cam Newton's Patriots debut, the first that their first game of the season and basically how he did cutting up some of his key plays and his crazy pregame outfits and everything else that he would like to wear to games. And he was pretty out there. So we'd have slides for that. So basically the ESPN stories feature was an added addition it, that that's new. That's only been around a few months that basically I helped nominate that I helped launch. I was nominated to help launch it. So then I had to interact with a few different departments to make that happen. Cause there were, there were a lot of design aspects involved to make it look professional. So I'd be interacting with the design team and, a couple other teams and it just it just really showed me how many different departments really work together even at such a big company like ESPN where you're pretty much in your certain departments and you don't really work with a lot of other groups as much but having that experience and being able to do that showed me just how important everybody is and how how many similarities really there are between different departments. So that definitely has been a good experience too. And it's very hands-on. And then recently on the side, I decided to launch my own sports podcast too. So that was an idea that I've had in my head for a while, but never really had it come to fruition until recently. So for about a month and a half or so beginning of December, 
I've had my own sports podcast. So definitely really active in the sports field. Wow. You, you just literally, you can write a book talking about your experience with Ithaca College and ESPN. You can literally write a book. Like <laughs> that, that, that's all I'm going to say about that. But talk about some of the struggles that you had when you was getting tasks done at Ithaca College and then transition to the same questions for the tasks you do for ESPN. Yeah, sure. So it definitely, I think one of the biggest things that I wish someone had told me going into this field that nobody had told me before that I would give advice to for other people that want to go into the sports media field was just knowing how much is really expected in short periods of time. So I remember sometimes in my classes or even during an ICTV show that I had to produce or something, there were a lot of tasks that had to get done in a short period of time. And if other people didn't get their stuff done, then that's really stressful and crunch time when you're getting ready to go live on a show and there's graphics not inputted into the system or somebody's name is spelled wrong or the rundown doesn't have certain cues for certain people and you have to go back in and fill that in at the end. And sometimes people don't realize how much of those little details can get really stressful and can really affect people because I remember so many times where everybody had their specific tasks and in one of my classes that was a TV studio related class, we had a group project and somebody's task wasn't done and one person called out sick from class that was supposed to be directing the show. So last minute we basically had to assign somebody else to direct the show but they had no notes on directing because they that wasn't their task for that specific project they were doing something else so we had to move everything around and everything was really scattered because we were missing a group member so i think one of the biggest challenges that i found in general between school and espn is just the amount of things that need to be done and how important it is to stay on top of your work because at espn you know there were so many times when especially when i was first starting where we had like, you know, a lot of different things that we have to get done and people would miss key plays in big games that they were assigned to because they were focusing on something else from one of their other games because, you know, you're assigned to multiple games at once and you have to keep track of all of them. And especially when it's football season and basketball comes back and you have to focus on college basketball games on Saturdays, but also college football games or on Sundays, same thing with the NFL things can go missed. If you're in the middle of cutting a highlight from one game, so you miss a big a big event or moment that happens in another game, those types of things can get missed. So it's, it's definitely a, the type of field where you have to really be able to stay on top of everything that you're doing and be confident in the content. Because once you go live, so many people can see that type of stuff. And even with videos that I posted at ESPN, I mean, as soon as you hit publish, there's already so many people that see it. So you can take down a video and unpublish it and fix something about it and put it back up. But already there's a lot of people that have seen it that that know the mistake already. So there's definitely been kind of a challenge to, you know, really understand that there are a lot of different responsibilities involved in that you need to really be on top of everything that you're doing because it affects more people than just you if you don't get something done. Wow. Again, you can literally write a book about all that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I could talk about it for a while. <laughs> I love the storytelling that you put into this. You really came a long way ever since graduating Ithaca College. You know, the school that Ed Cohen, who was like the radio play by play for New York Knicks, are. But yeah, yeah. Again, you're a Boston sports fanatic, so you probably would not have. I don't know if you knew about Ed Cohen, but if you have it, you could just research it. But um, yeah. Working at ESPN, I could see why when I flip to ESPN, the content and highlights they put together is just so amazing. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, it's, it's tough because you really have to understand the average fan and the things that resonate the most with them. And it also varies by platform because, you know, our Facebook audience isn't the same audience as our Twitter audience or people that watch our YouTube videos. So the demographic is different. So the content is going to vary based on those platforms, based on, you know, who the audience is for each platform. Exactly. But just to ask, answer this real quick. Um, have you ever thought about having an on-air related position for ESPN when you was going through college or what you're doing right now is what you're destined to do when you came into college? Yeah, so being on air definitely was my goal when I came into college. I was more open-minded 
than that though, because I wanted to learn about different parts of the industry to see if there was something else that maybe I want to do too. So I went into college with an open mind and just hoping that I could learn about as many different parts of the media industry as I can. The on-air side definitely is still my ultimate goal. And that's part of the main reason why I started my Boston Balling podcast on the side, because that's a good way for me to have my own platform to, you know, express views on things going on in Boston sports and give other people a chance to come on and express their opinions on things going on in Boston sports too. So it definitely allowed me to be able to, um, you know, break into that side of things and have my own platform to do that. And I'm still, I'm still hoping that I can find a way to break into the on-air side of the industry, um, you know, in a professional setting, but I'm hoping that through the podcast experience that that can help me as well. And, and I, I'm going to keep going along and keep making connections and even at other companies and just see if, if there's possibilities that can open up in terms of an on-air role, because it's all about working your way up and, you know, the longer you've been in the industry, the more opportunities that you'll get and the more diverse your resume is too. Because I also found that having that diversity in my internships and just having a lot of different experiences, I feel like might have put me ahead of some other people in terms of when I was looking for jobs, because the fact that I can do so many things and I could talk about all these different skills and experiences I developed in an interview, it just makes you, it just makes you more credible and just makes you more desirable for jobs later on in the field. So definitely being on the digital media side at ESPN has been really beneficial for me because it was a side of the industry I wasn't as familiar with from college, but it's given me a lot of skills that I'm going to need to carry on through the rest of my career in the media industry. And I've gotten, a, you know, significantly better at my video editing skills and everything else. So, and, and communication and working with a lot of different types of people and being adaptable. So there's definitely a lot that I learned from, from being on that side of the industry, but being on air is definitely still the ultimate goal. So I'm just figuring out the best way for me to get there and navigate to that side of the industry. That is very amazing. I mean, you you really understand that the role towards the, I mean, the journey towards getting that on-air gig is going to take a long, long time. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's, it's definitely not something that is an easy thing to do. You know, the media industry is a hard field to be in, but it can also be very rewarding. And it's kind of, you get out of it what you put in. So if you put in the effort and the work and you make connections and you meet people and you create opportunities for yourself, that's only going to, that's only going to put you ahead. And, and I find that I'm, you know, doing a lot to create other opportunities for myself, even outside my direct role at ESPN and just doing things outside of, of work that could help grow me, my career and, and help me get on, on the right track for me and everything. So I feel like having my own podcast on the side just kind of shows that I'm, that I'm motivated and I really want to be in this field. That's the same thing it is with my podcast turn TV show, turn social media show, where I'm not just using it as a podcast. I also use it to cover events as well for this one. So yeah, I was always told by, um, by an earlier special guest that sometimes you have to create your own opportunities and you create your own opportunities with your podcast, Boston Ballin. Yeah, you do have to create your own opportunities. That's a big thing. And I know a lot of people, you know, mentors I've had in the field and everything else have preach that to everybody guest speakers we had at Ithaca College that were that were really successful in the field that would come in and talk to us in our classes would always say create your own opportunities because even your direct role at work um, within your department or within your company you can create ways to to grow on your own and, and nobody's going to come to you and present you with those opportunities unless they know that you're really motivated to do it and a lot of times you have to look for those opportunities and they won't come to you. So that applies to in a work setting or just outside of, of work or life in general. There's a lot of, a lot of things that you can learn from just to doing, creating your own opportunities because you can, who knows, you could open up more doors by creating your own possibilities than you ever would have if you didn't, if you didn't create those opportunities. And that is how you get your foot in the door. You said it best. Now get into the Boston teams like what are your impressions about the Boston Celtics up until yesterday? Yeah, you know, 
the Celtics are one of those teams that I have high hopes for every year. And then they end up disappointing in the playoffs because, you know, they have a really good talented roster every year and they play well and they go to the postseason and they just don't have enough to be able to go all the way. And the thing that concerns me is something that I expressed in the beginning of the season on my show that that was going to be a concern for me, which was kind of their bench and how the bench was going to be performing. And so far, you know, people have been getting more and more involved in the offense, but yesterday was, was tough because they, you know, they had a pretty rough game yesterday and granted there were players that had been out because of, of COVID protocols and everything else, but an exposure to people with COVID, but you know, Jason Tatum obviously is a huge aspect of, of that offense. And when he's not playing, it's, it's hard to really know how everybody else is going to perform. And it just seems like Jalen Brown relies a lot on him and granted Kemba just came back yesterday. And so we need to cut him some slack because he's been out. So it, it was expected that he was going to be a little rusty because he was just coming back, you know, and, and he still isn't fully healthy. So I think it's going to take time to work him back into the offense and, you know, they're playing a really, really good basketball overall right now. Yesterday's game w- was rough and you obviously can't win every game, but I just hope that those bench players can really keep performing the way that they're performing because depth was always an issue for the Celtics in the past that other teams didn't really lack as much. So if the, if the people on the bench can keep getting more involved and just keep growing, I think that this could be a really, really good team um, in the Eastern Conference. And, I mean, you know, we've seen a lot of consistency on the offensive side of the ball from a lot of players, but I think defensively they need to improve still. And I think that there's a lot, a lot of question marks surrounding the rest of the season in terms of, you know, obviously injuries and everything else. But they're playing really good basketball overall right now and they've beaten some good teams already so that's promising but um when it comes to the postseason they're just going to have to keep improving and the players that are coming off the bench are really going to have to keep getting more involved in the offense um and if they do that then they could be a team that are serious contenders when it comes to the playoffs this year so I'm excited to see how the rest of the season goes but I think it's just going to be a matter of you know is everybody in sync are people are people not getting injured? Are people not getting COVID? Because unfortunately that's one of the situations we're in now and some a big thing everybody has to consider. Um, and just if things continue to go smoothly and they have the chemistry already there and, and that chemistry doesn't seem like it's going to be broken. And chemistry is a big thing in a sport like basketball. It, it, everybody needs to be in sync with each other. And if that's not happening, then it's not going to work. And we've seen the Celtics, you know, crumble and not work like when Kyrie was there because he didn't really fit in with the system or with the coaching or just with the chemistry that they had established. So I think that the chemistry that this team has now and the young players are starting to show a lot of promise. I think it's really exciting for the rest of the season, but definitely have some concerns, but overall um, I'm happy with what I've seen so far. Yeah. I mean, the Boston Celtics, they've had some promising playoff runs, like especially when Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown first came into the league. I mean, Look, the two appearances to the conference finals, like they also they've been to the first round like almost every year since Jason Tatum came yeah. on the roster. And uh yeah, this is gonna be very tough for the Boston Celtics because well, the Miami Heat's at least have problems after what we saw in the NBA bubble. But they yeah. have to compete with the newly event Brooklyn Nets, even if Kyrie ever doesn't play for the rest of the season. And Who knows? Yeah. Put up with the Milwaukee Bucks, then you got the Philadelphia 76ers, which you have beaten before. So yeah. I think the Pacers too, I mean, after that Harden trade based on what they got, I mean, I don't think they're going to be an easy team in the Eastern conference either. I think that that whole Harden trade changed a lot of things for a lot of different teams. And I mean, with Brooklyn, I mean, yeah, for them, it's either they're contenders now or bust essentially it's either they win a championship or the next or in the next couple of years or they don't. And then they're kind of starting over again because they gave up a lot of players, a lot of young talent and pretty much the whole depth of their roster for James Harden. So I think that, you know, that's a lot to give up for one player and at this, at the risk, which it is a risk based on their personalities that the chemistry doesn't work out between Harden, KD and Kyrie, because they all have strong personalities that that could end up just crumbling in their faces. And obviously on paper, yeah, I'm super worried about having to face Brooklyn. I think that that's going to be 
obviously a challenge and Harden came out and had a triple double in his first game in Nets uniform. So that's obviously something to be concerned about. But I think that, I think that in terms of chemistry, if those three don't work well together, then it's not going to work for them. And then they're kind of stuck for a long time because then they're just going to have to regrow from the bottom because they got rid of a lot of their young talent that built up a lot of the depth and, and bench of that roster. Exactly. And not to mention the fact that we saw the way they performed against Brooklyn on Christmas Day not too many weeks ago. So who's to say, yeah. well, we at least know Boston's going to put up a much better fight than what we saw in that game if they actually, if a playoff series between the Nets and the Celtics take place. Oh, yeah. So yeah. That's the least of your worries. Right? Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. But I think, you know, I think it's still early too. And, and we have to remember that a lot of these teams, it's different after coming out of the bubble. You know what I mean? They got so used to being in the bubble that now they're out of it. And teams, I think, came out a little rusty. And there are still so many more games left to play that it's obviously too soon to draw a ton of conclusions right now. But, you know, based on how everything looks right now and how the Celtics are playing, I'd be relatively confident in them in the postseason. I do think that there's still a little more work that needs to be done on the defensive side of the ball. But overall, I think that, you know, obviously they're definitely going to be a playoff team. I'd probably put them, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're at the top of the East right now, but I'd, I'd probably put them, you know, at, by the time that the postseason comes around, I probably would say I'd put them around four ish based on how the regular season finishes, which is not terrible. But again, we've, we've been so, this has just been so tough and frustrating seeing them go to the postseason so much and seeing them have all this promise only to just, you know, and end up not making it to the finals. And that year that they lost to LeBron and the Cavs, in game seven. And I really, really thought that that was going to be the Celtics year. That was just so disappointing because I was like, come on, of course, like LeBron comes in and steps in and, and ruins it. And they looked really good in that whole series. And then of course they had to drop in game seven. And ever since then, it's just been a stressful time for the Celtics because they do have the talent, but they are still a relatively young team and they, they're, they're facing a lot of experienced players in the Eastern conference now. And that I think is going to be something that they could that they could find trouble with too. Yeah, but when the Boston Celtics are not really having much success, I mean, you've had success with other Boston championships or Massachusetts related championships throughout the 2010s and of course the 2000s as well. I mean, why don't you tell me your favorite championship season from any of the sports teams that you watch, starting with the Boston Celtics, obviously the one in the way, like. Wait, say my favorite championship for any of the teams. Like my favorite championship season, you mean? Yeah, starting with the Boston Celtics. Um, so the Celtics, you know, have had a lot of 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 um good championship seasons. You know, honestly, I think their last championship season was my favorite just because they had a really, really special team then. And like, little did we know that a lot was going to change with the Celtics after that championship run. And, you know, they came off that season and I was like, oh, this is going to be great. Like the Celtics have a great future. Like we have a lot of great classic players on this team right now. Like this is perfect. Like we're going to be that team that, you know, is going to be really, really hard to beat. And then, you know, time passes and so much changes about the Celtics that when you look back on that championship team now, you almost grow an appreciation for the players that they had at that point, because those are the types of players that were on that team that, you know, not that, not that are hard to replace, but kind of in terms of, you know, what they meant to the game of basketball and everything else. And that's the type of team I feel like that you're not going to get a lot of that. I feel like, you know, going forward and, and yeah, like, I mean, maybe there's something special about this Celtics team and, when they do win a championship now, I mean, I think it's, it, it can be special, but you know, you look at some of those players and those are the types of players that everybody's going to remember forever. You know what I mean? And it's hard to not have an appreciation for that and looking back on it and realizing how good it felt to have that, that, that championship run and, you know, be that team that everybody's like, Oh yeah, the Celtics are the team to beat. And then kind of like flash forward sometime and, 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 not seeing a lot of that and not seeing those types of players now, like it, that's, it's just hard to compare to that. But again, you know, the Celtics have had a lot of special championship runs before that too. So it's, it's hard to really say, you know, like that they weren't all great, but 
there was just a lot of classic players, I think, that made up a lot of those championship runs that are going to be hard to to match with now. You know, like the Kevin Garnett's of the world and the Paul Pierce's of the world that were that were classic Celtics players that you know like that kind of talent and that kind of you know legend goes unmatched I feel like and I mean hopefully this Celtics team gives us something that we can remember but you know those players are just kind of the types of players that people are going to look back on and be like wow like I'm never going to forget those like those are the types of players that people are always going to associate with the Celtics and those are the types of championship runs that to me are I, I appreciate more because I appreciate the players that were on those teams that, you know, I'm always going to associate with the Reds, with the Reds, with the Celtics. And, um, and I think like with this current team, if they do win a championship, yeah, I mean, I'm going to remember it as a Celtics fan. I'm going to be like, Oh yeah, they won, they won the NBA championship in 2021 or 2022 or whatever it ends up being. But, you know, a lot of the players on it, I mean, outside of maybe Jason Tatum, like who knows like really what's going to happen with their future like will they go down as legends to sell as celtics legends or legends to the game of basketball like, i don't know maybe but you know it's 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 hard to not appreciate those types of players and those types of championship runs yeah it really is now favorite red sox championship because they've had a couple during your time as a boston fan in the 2000s and yeah. 2010s yeah you know so to me with the Red Sox, there's been a lot of good seasons I enjoy watching with the Red Sox. I mean, baseball is my favorite sport. I think, um, you know, I, I've grown up following baseball the most and, and just been like a really, really big Red Sox fan my whole life. But I honestly don't think that any championship is ever going to beat that first season that they broke the a curse in 2004. I think that that year – with the players that they had on that team too, you know, that was probably the most special Red Sox team I'd say in terms of, you know, the players that, that made up that championship run and granted 2018 was physically their best season ever in terms of their record. And that was a fun team to watch, but, you know, after all of that time without winning a championship and then you watch them win the world series in 2004, there was no better feeling I can think of than that. And and I couldn't think of any better feeling in the world for any other championship than I did then. And, you know, I think that one of the biggest reasons for that is their, you know, what it took for them to get there. I mean, they were not expected to win. I mean, they had to come back from being down three games to none against my rival New York Yankees, you know what I mean? To go to the world series. And, and so that's just, that's a feel special feeling to me because first of all, it's, it's the Yankees, but second of all, just coming back, being the only team to ever be able to do that and come back from down three Oh and, and, and win the whole thing that leaves a mark on, on, on baseball fans and Red Sox fans in particular. And that kind of sparked a lot of, you know, like a lot of hope going forward. And it sparked a lot of good Red Sox teams that we've seen, since then so ever since they won that world series it was almost like that was them getting over the big hump and then moving forward they won a few more championships after that and i hope that that obviously continues and we see one maybe in the next few years or something i don't know but when when you think of the red sox and that team a lot of people think of that year because that was really the year that things got started and and it was kind of you know starting a new future and rebuilding the team and 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 then they went back to the world series a few years later so i feel like it's just that was that year was just a true representation of of hope and just being able to turn things around and that was the, their year they really wanted to win and and they left it all on the field and that was just a really special thing to watch because i mean that was you know i mean i was still relatively young when when that world series happened so that was one of the first big championships that I can really remember from one of my teams because it was it was just a really, really special moment seeing that and after everything that they had been through and not seeing a championship in that much time. I think it's, you know, it's 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 really special. It's almost like when the Cubs won the World Series a few years ago and how they felt after their championship because it had been so long for them. So it's it, it was definitely just that one. I'd say to me was because it, it jumpstarted a lot of successful 
Red Sox teams after that. And we haven't really seen the Red Sox have a lot of bad seasons since then. I mean, yeah, there has been some bad seasons like, you know, this past year included, but consistently we haven't really seen them be a bad team really much in the two thousands after they won that world series in general, you know, I'd say over the last 16 years or so, whatever it was, we haven't really seen consistently bad seasons. We've seen like bad seasons here and there, but then they always kind of get back in it and find a way to be contenders a year or two later. So the consistency factor has been there and it really all started with that championship. And so I think when I think about the Red Sox, you know, that I associate it with that. And I mean, you know, David Ortiz is my favorite all time Red Sox player as it is. So it's hard to not pick a championship team that he was on as my favorite either. Um, and, you know, there's just a lot of classic Red Sox players on that team that nobody's ever going to forget. And with the 2018 championship, you know, their most recent one from, from then from 2004 to 2018, obviously a lot's changed in terms of who was on the team and everything else. And even from 2018 to now, there's been some changes, big changes to the roster. And so, I can't even look at the Red Sox now and associate it with their 2018 championship because so much has changed. So I think that that's a, that's a, that's a world series championship that I'm going to look back on forever and just remember those players and remember that that's what changed everything for this team. And, and they've pretty much been, you know, on track since then. And and we'll see what happens this year. Yeah. Let's not forget the Boston Red Sox. They always load themselves with batters. I mean, you mentioned David Ortiz, they also had Manny Ramirez. He exactly. did some serious home runs back in the 2000s, I remember. Yeah. So much you could even, man. And I even remember That's David Ortiz right in a crazy grand slam in, in a playoff game against the Detroit Tigers. Oh, Nothing yeah. For that. that was yeah. nuts. I know. And that's a moment. That's another moment that people that people think back to from that year and are just not going to forget. You never going to forget. Ramirez is a classic, classic Red Sox, too, like, you know what I mean? Like he, um, he's, uh, he's going to be another one that, that people are just never going to be able to associate with anything else. I don't think either. And when you think about those types of Red Sox players, you think about championships and breaking a curse and home runs, you know what I mean? And everybody like, you know, like, I don't know if you're ever going to find somebody that had that same kind of effect that big poppy had to be able to just come into a game and like, you knew that him stepping up to the plate in a really crucial situation, like the chances of him hitting a home run are pretty high. And I feel like we started to see glimpses of that with Mookie Betts, or at least get some sort of hit to help save the game or something like that. And and when Mookie would step up to the plate, I feel like we started to feel that way too. And you would get a similar sense of like, Oh, you know, like Mookie's about to save this game for us right now. It's going to be okay. And then obviously they traded Mookie so now it's like there's not really anybody on the team that you can think of right now that kind of has that effect. And I don't think anybody will ever have the same kind of effect that Big Poppy had because he always was the one in those clutch situations that you wanted to be stepping up to the plate if, you know, the bases were loaded at the bottom of the ninth and they were down by a run or two. You know what I mean? Like he was always the player that you'd want in that situation. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Boston, they, they're going to get back to being a World Series champion again. You never know. I love baseball. It's, it's definitely my favorite sport. I, um, you know, I like a lot of different sports and everything else, but baseball has a soft spot in my heart because it just goes the furthest back for me. And, and I just, you know, I have like a really big appreciation for it. I feel like it's kind of an underappreciated sport overall too. Cause I feel like a lot of people are like, well, it's boring. Like I don't want to sit and watch, you know, people hit pop outs or, 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 you know, strike out every three seconds or like, just watch nine innings of that. Like it's too slow of a game. And like, you know, I could see that, but I feel like if you like baseball, then you really love baseball because you have an appreciation for it. Like I've never really met people that are like baseball's okay. You know what I mean? It's either like, I feel like you love it or you just don't really follow it and don't really bother with it. Yeah, that's true. I mean, baseball, it keeps you entertained when basketball and football is not around. Literally. Exactly. Yeah. Like, because it's in the summer, that's like, what else are you really going to watch besides baseball? You know what I mean? Like the NBA. No, I'm kidding. But um, yeah. Like once the NBA season is over though, you know what I mean? Like since obviously this year was different, but like with the NBA season usually ending in June, 
it's like for the next couple of months after that until football starts, it's like there really isn't anything else really to watch besides baseball. Yes, exactly. so it keeps people it keeps people entertained during that that period before their football starts. But for me, I'm just I, I just watch baseball the whole season. Like you know, like I'll 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 watch games. Like it was funny because usually like over the summer, like I would I would you know make sure my schedule revolves around when the Red Sox play. So like if the Red Sox had like a seven o'clock game and my friends wanted to hang out, I'd be like. Oh yeah, like I can go out to dinner with you guys as long as it's early because I need to get back in time for the Red Sox game or things like that. Like that that's something that I would always do. Like I'd center my schedule around when the Red Sox played and I really didn't miss many games at all and that's usually how I am. Like you know, I have the Nesson app on my phone and I can I can watch Red Sox games through there. Um and so even if I'm like on the road or something, I would always find that I'd be having the Red Sox game on or like I'd be listening to it in the car, the radio version. So I definitely have a big appreciation for baseball. I think it's a great sport and I'm excited to see what happens this season. I'm curious if they're actually going to end up having a full 162 game season or not, because um, they're saying as of now that they're going to and that they plan on starting spring training on time but I feel like it's just so hard to say with this whole COVID thing like if if that's going to actually happen you know what I mean like it, it's really hard to know like and it's it's unfortunate because like you want you like you you want it to happen and like I have high hopes that it'll happen but at the same time it's like what if it doesn't you know what I mean it's like what if what if like what if like we end up in in a situation where like they have to cancel all these games and like it's just not the same and I mean, they were able to do it last year without a bubble, but I just want to see, I just want to see a full length season because I just feel like what they had last season with 60 games was just not enough. Like, I feel like that's just not enough games. You know what I mean? Like it's baseball. Like it needs to have baseball's not baseball. Shouldn't be like, how did I word it before? Baseball shouldn't be like a sprint. It's more of like a marathon. And it's the type of sport that like, it kind of ruins the idea of the game. If you don't have, enough games. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a type of sport that it's meant to have more games and it's meant to, you know, be dragged out because there's a lot of teams, like every team will go through slumps in the season where they just, you know, won't be performing well, or maybe they'll, they'll lose, you know, go on like an eight game losing streak or something in the 60 game season. That's hard to come back from, you know what I mean? And and every team has those kinds of slumps, but in a regular length season, like it gives you the opportunity to be able to like, you know, in a regular length season, like you can make up for that after and you can still be okay and maybe still go to the postseason. So I just hope that, I hope that there's a way that they can do it where, where they can make the the regular length season work and, and everything works out and, and stuff like that. And I think that if it came down to having a do to do some kind of bubble for the postseason, maybe they do that, but I'm just, I'm just really excited for baseball and I hope that it's actually able to happen the right way with the right amount of games and hopefully with some fans down the road, maybe by the summer, which obviously might be asking for a lot, but I'm, I'm hoping that that can happen. I have high hopes that they can make it work with fans in, in stadiums across the country by at least by the time the postseason comes around. That is actually important. I mean, at the very least, last season, you got a baseball season, even if it was just 60 games, playing against your own division and the opposite division from the opposite conference or whatever. But, yeah, you, you really got a baseball season. So all we can do is just cherish it, even if it comes to the expense of not having fans allowed. Yeah, that was a hard thing, I think, last year, too, was not being able to go to games because – you know, I, I, I'm so used to going to Red Sox games in the summer. It's one of my favorite things about the summer is, is going to a baseball game and hanging out with people. And I mean, even people that don't like watching baseball on TV really as much, I feel like it's still an enjoyable experience to go to a baseball game because it's fun to go there and, and hang out with your friends or whoever you're with and everything and, um, and socialize. And so I've been to attend baseball games, even with people that don't like watching them, but that was something I was definitely missing about last summer was not being able to just, you know, get a ticket and go to a Red Sox game. And I'm not a fan. I don't, I don't know how you feel about this, but I'm really not a fan of like the fake crowd noise and the cardboard cutouts at games. 
Yeah, it was kind of weird to me at first, but you know, you get adjusted to it as you're watching the baseball games. I mean, I I don't mind not non I don't mind empty fields or empty arena games to be honest, because it's better than not having any sports for like four months, where you're literally just I don't know how do you manage to work during the pandemic because you had four months of no live sports going on, literally four months. When you're not counting NASCAR and when you're not counting the the Korean baseball organization. You really went four months without any live sports. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I even found that to be a struggle at ESPN too, even, you know, with my job was, was like the lack of sports being on because it, we lost a lot of viewership at that point. There, there, there wasn't as much for people to watch on ESPN and granted, you know, we, we still had our studio shows on and we were showing reruns of things, but it's it was a hard period because people love watching their sports and when there were no, was nothing on it was hard for everybody because like you know you get excited for your sports and it was just it was just a a, a tough period and, and my job was definitely still i mean we did a lot of longer form projects and everything else and and we found stuff to do but the day-to-day -day was just not nearly as busy because there was nothing on so it was just it was just I mean, and granted, we still had things going on that we'd cover, like, you know, people being traded or free agency, things like that. But it, it was weird. It was just a weird period of time. And, you know, it ended up hurting a lot of a lot of sports companies, ESPN, especially. And, and you know, there's a lot of consequences to that now, because when, when there was a period with those sports on, it just was it was tough. And, and even like the teams lost revenue and stuff, you know, but I feel like, like you said, I think that's a good point. I feel like as we go into 2021 and we think about how the structure of sports might look like in 2021, I feel like I'd rather have sports with no fans and just have, you know, like the sound effects and everything else that as corny as they are, they do kind of grow on you. Like you said, like, I feel like I'd still rather have that than just not have sports at all, because that was just such a, a tough thing to go through when there weren't sports on and everybody was like, you know, it didn't, it wasn't able to watch their favorite teams because they weren't on, you know what I mean? So I feel like I'd rather just have, I'd rather have sports in some way, shape or form than not have them at all. And I think that that's what people need to realize now is like, yeah, it sucks to not have fans right now in the stands at like, you know, NBA games or something, but at, at the same time, you know, would you rather just not have those games at all? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the whole time I've been living through that, all I could think is, how am I even surviving during this no sports fanatic? Like, where well, there's nothing really going on. How, how how am I even surviving? How are we humans going through what we went through in 2020? Only in 2020. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you think about it and it's like, oh, by 2021, somehow people thought this pandemic was just going to go away once 2021 hit and that everything was just automatically going to go back to normal. But I was like, unfortunately, that's not how it's going to be. Like, there is going to be some time in 2021 that we're still in this situation, you know what I mean? Cause you know, like things are gonna take time and, and everything else. And I feel like it's it's tough cause you know, even with football and I mean, I know we haven't, we haven't talked a lot about football but that's a sport where, you know the fans are a big part of the game and seeing, you know it, it was cool to see how many fans were in the stands at you know the games this weekend like there were a lot of fans in the stands um in green bay and in fans in the stands in kc and like during the regular season when the when a lot of the stadiums didn't have fans i feel like that kind of took away from some of what football is and i feel like as a fan you contribute a lot to how the teams play if you're in the stands based on you know the cheering and, and the energy that you bring and i feel like a lot of teams even though even when even even when they had home games it didn't really feel like they were playing at home i feel like because they didn't have their fan base there to cheer for them and the fans just the fans play a huge part in in games and i feel like people didn't really realize that or realize how important we as fans are to the game until this whole situation happened do you know what i mean it's just like it's just and that applies to any sport i feel like too that if you're a fan and you're watching a game it's just really important i feel like to be engaged in the game. And, and I feel like that showed in, in performances sometimes that that teams had, because that's what that's what we could take out of 2020 when it comes to sports, I feel like is like being at the game and in attendance, that's actually the teams like feed off of that energy. 
That is actually true. And you know what? I'm going to tell you like I told you know, my older fan that also had a problem watching to the NFL games with no fans. I mean, you still get some enjoyment from the moments that happen within the NFL games. My, even if it comes at the expense of not having any crowds, like you still get some enjoyment from a gateway to field goal or a gateway to touchdown or the or that crazy catch from Arizona did to pull off a comfort line win against the Buffalo Bills. Yeah, you that was crazy. Moments from that. You, and you can still, since we're on the subject of Boston, get enjoyment for when Cam Newton's Patriots came from behind and defeated the New York Jets on Monday Night Football. Oh, that was such a stressful game to watch, too, because I thought they were going to lose. And I was like, we cannot, absolutely cannot be losing to the Jets. I was like, this is just an utter embarrassment, and this game should not be this close. And if this is a game that we're going to lose, then I might just quit and just not watch the rest of the season. <laughs> But, I mean, I know what you mean, though, because it's like it's it's like those types of situations like, yeah, I mean, the Patriots rallied back and granted it took a game winning field goal to beat the Jets, but they still pulled out the win. And they even had another game this year that I can remember where they were playing the Bills and that came close. They were like down by a field goal and they were in field goal range already. So all he really had to do was like hold on to the ball and he ended up fumbling the ball and they lost that game. Um, and that was bad because, you know, you can look back on it now and be like, I wonder if they would have made the postseason if they won that game or, or obviously you can speculate that with a lot of games, but that was another game in particular that I was like, yeah, imagine being at this game. Like, you know, maybe we could have given more energy to, to um, Cam and to be able to really, um, you know, start that rally and make it happen. And with Tom Brady, he was the type of person that I feel like, having him on the team, you could always rely on him to be clutch and to just in those types of situations, just um, rally everybody and, and be like, okay, we're still in this. And you knew that if games were close towards the end, you could never rule out the Patriots when you had Tom Brady on your team, because he was so good at rallying everybody to, to, to come back in games. And I feel like that was something that, that Cam wasn't as good at. Exactly. And uh, since we're on the subject of Tom Brady, what is your favorite Patriots championship win? Because outside the losses against the Giants twice and the Eagles, the Patriots have had a lot of championship moments. But yeah, that NFC East, that NFC East really has uh, has given us trouble. And that 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 Eagles, that Eagles championship run, um, that was a tough one to watch because. I, I really thought I was really confident. I mean, you know, the Patriots had a really good year. They were looking pretty good. And I had high hopes for them that, that year. I was like this, I, I was like, this could be our year, you know, like, I really feel like this, they, like we can do this. And um, them losing just was really, really devastating. Cause I was just like, this is so upsetting and so frustrating, but you know, at the same time, I was like, okay, fine. Eagles fans, like you can have your, your championship, but you know, that's fine. Like um, Nick Foles, it was a really good asset to that team. And I think that he um, did a really good job and the Patriots ended up coming back and winning the next year against the Rams anyway, which that was probably one of the most boring games I've ever watched. Not to be honest, but I mean, they pulled out the win, so I'll take it. But my favorite Patriots championship. See, this one is hard. There's been a lot. I, I feel like I really do have to say that year that they rallied back and beat the Falcons. Though. I had a feeling he was going to go there. That was, was like that. How do, you, how do you like, how do you, how did somebody top that championship? Just because, you know, they were pretty much out of that game by halftime. Like everybody thought the game was pretty much over. And like, I mean, they were down by so much. It's like, okay, yeah, it's 28 to three. We have no chance. And even for most of the third quarter, the score was like that too. So I was like, yeah, there's no way they're going to win this game because the comeback pretty much happened all in the fourth quarter. And, you know, they started scoring again. And I remember I was in L.A. then because I was doing a semester long program in L.A. through Ithaca College. So I was watching it at a sports bar in L.A. And I was with one of my friends and I was like, you know, I'm going to leave. Like, there's no point in staying here. Like, they're not going to win this game. And like and. And then like, she was like, are you sure it's your team? Like, are you sure you don't want to say? And I was like, yeah, you know, like this is, this is pointless. Like there's no way they're going to win. But then I kind of in my head was like, you know, the Patriots have always kind of been a second half team. So 
maybe I should stay because you know like why not like maybe there's a chance that they come back and win and I in my head I was laughing at that statement but I was like you know I also want to see the halftime show so I'll stay whatever so I stayed um you know and then you know kept watching and stuff and pretty much everybody in that sports bar was cheering for the Falcons except for me and this one couple that was sitting behind me I remember that were Patriots fans I was like oh thank thank you there's a couple other Patriots fans in here like I was so happy um but then you know like they started coming back and then when they tied the game, that's when I had a feeling that they, that they were going to win. Cause I was like, okay, yeah, Brady's locked in now. The defense is finally starting to do their job. And like this, this seems like it's going to be it. And people look back on that and that comeback and it's just, it's crazy. Like, we're, I don't know if we're ever going to see something like that again in a Super Bowl, that type of comeback. And you look back at that and it's like, yeah, that just is really, that just is really telling of how good, the Patriots actually really were and how good of a quarterback Brady was. And I mean, the fact that the defense was able to hold the Falcons to zero points after that, you know what I mean? And just hold, for pretty much the whole second half, just hold them to zero points. is pretty crazy. It's, it's you know, not even giving up a field goal or anything either. Um, you look back at that and it's like, are we ever going to see that type of comeback in a Super Bowl again? Possibly. There are a lot of great quarterbacks that are capable of pulling it off. Yeah. No, maybe, yeah, but it's just, I don't know. That's just such a memorable Super Bowl for me because I, I don't know that, I mean, you can be the best quarterback in the world, but that's such a hard thing to do, especially in the Super Bowl, you know, when you're, play, when you're playing a really, really good NFC team and, and your defense gives up zero points. It's like, what are the chances of that, you know, like in the Super Bowl, like even if, because even if they gave up another field goal, to the Falcons, then it probably would have been out of reach. You know what I mean? So everybody in the second half, not even just the second half, but the fourth quarter in particular, everybody just really seemed to click and be able to just figure things out. And they did it and and they won they won the Super Bowl that year. And you know, there's a lot of good Patriots moments I'd say I've had and it's never gonna be the same again without Brady. We're never gonna see that type of dynasty with the Patriots ever again unfortunately, just because, you know, that that's irreplaceable talent and just watching him play in, on a playoff game for another team is just very, very difficult to see. And, and just watching him do things that he would do with the Patriots and just, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, that's playoff Tom Brady. You know, like we, we knew, we knew, we knew that, that this was going to happen. Like he's playoff Tom Brady, you know, we've seen this so many times and just, I'm just going to miss that aspect of the Patriots. And I just hope that they can figure something out that sets up hope for their future because there's a lot, you know, there, there's a, there's a lot of teams out there that are going to be really good now. And, and I feel like KC is one of those teams that is going to be really good for a while. And there's other teams that are only getting better. You know, I think Cleveland's going to keep getting better. So I just hope that the Patriots can, you know, just kind of, find a way to rebuild their roster and, and get back into playoff contention. But it's just not going to be the same Patriots team again that we ever saw when we had, you know, Brady and Gronk on the team and just, just that combo of, of Belichick and Brady and two of arguably the greatest of all time in their, their respective positions, you know? So it's, it's just, it's just not going to be the same again. So I'm going to definitely cherish, I think every Patriots moment that I had with them because it's just, it's just, we're not going to see that type of Patriots team again, unfortunately. And I think maybe we see that happen with other teams. Like if they end up being really good, like, I mean, like maybe the chiefs develop a dynasty, like the Patriots had or something, you know what I mean? But I, I just, I don't know if um, we're ever going to see that from the Patriots again, just because it's a rare type of talent that, you know, we can never find. And I hope that Tampa Bay appreciates um, Tom being there because I feel like he felt a lot towards the end like he wasn't appreciated as much in New England so yeah there's been a lot, a lot of good Patriots moments but um, you know I definitely look back at that Falcons one I think as my most my the most memorable one for me because that was just a really special year and a really special comeback when people had ruled them out of that game by halftime and then Tom Brady just remind, decided to remind everybody of who he was in the second half and the Falcons since then just kind of haven't been that good either. You know, like they just have, have had a few rough years since going to, since that Super Bowl trip. And it's just, it's crazy to think about that because 
you know, you go from being in the Super Bowl to really not being that good and they're having a hard time growing that back now. So that kind of did a lot for them. That did a lot of damage for them. And I guess they kind of needed to win the Super Bowl that year because that was the first one. It seemed like they would have gotten in presumably what's going to be a while too. So, you know, I love the Patriots. I think that I, I you know, I miss, I'm going to miss all of that. And I'm going to miss those types of players being on the team and legends to the game of football. And I just hope that when the Patriots do re kind of redesign their, their offense, I hope that, you know, we can, we can, start to get back on a track of, of success, but it's, it was definitely this past season was tough being a Patriots fan because, you know, we're not used to that, but everybody's like, you know, like you've had 20 good years of success. Like you can be like, you know, you can have a down year one time. You know what I mean? Like you can have one year that is a down season. And then like next year, I'm sure like Belichick will find a way to get you back into playoff contention. You know what I mean? So I, I feel like it's just, <laughs> which is kind of true. Like, so I guess we'll see what happens, but, but that Falcon Super Bowl is arguably probably my favorite championship of all of my teams, maybe even. Exactly. And I kind of knew it was going to go there anyway, because let's face it, Tom Brady is literally the Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan of the NFL. What's yeah. That? Yeah. Exactly. Oh. And so it's like, it's like his impact to his sport is, is like, the impact that Kobe or MJ were going to have on their sport. And, and once Brady retires, the sport of football might not be the same ever again. No, it won't. Unless Baker Mayfield has that type of dynasty, but you never know. You really Patrick never know. Mahomes, maybe. Well, that concludes this episode of Nothing But That Sports Talk. Thank you for stopping by, Gabby, and telling me about your ESPN career, as well as your favorite championship wins from the Boston sports teams. And to all the big balls out there, get your head in the game. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was awesome.